Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report, and uh, we have our expert panel, John Moore, who has his own show at 7 to 9 a.m. on the Republic Radio, Central Standard Time, and Morrison, our scientist that deals with so many areas, including volcanoes and earthquakes, the ultraviolet light issues dealing with uh, near space, and near space objects, such as JPL's object you mentioned uh, last week, which is the 2012 DA-14. Uh, welcome back, John and Ann. Hello. Good to be here, Dr. Bill. Hi, John. Uh, and uh, that link that you gave there, I had uh, some other people say skeptical things, saying they didn't think it was that big. Again, can you repeat the, some of the information on the size of the object and the latest recalculation that you had last week? Is there any updates on that object, DA, uh, 2012 DA-14? How big is it? How many uh, meters across is it expected to be? And how close is it likely? Uh, how likely is the 100%, you know, I think it says 1% chance or greater chance of an impact on Earth, but it carries a debris field. How big is it? Oh, it's about the size, it's about two-thirds of the size of a football field. It's about the size of a object that hit in uh, northern Russia and Siberia in 1908. So how many meters across would that be? Oh, well, uh, oh, gee, I think John had that information. I don't have it in front of me. John, John, do, you have that, John do you have that info uh, on that? I, I, I don't have that handy. It didn't impress me as being all that large, but something that big uh, going a, uh, you know, several thousand miles an hour is going to... Yeah, but in big. other words, it's big enough to take out a chunk of France if it hit. 1% chance is pretty big, and of course each calculation makes it closer and closer, plus it has a debris field, and it may not be the only object that's coming into near space. Uh, John, what's your latest update in terms of what's going on? Because I know you're doing well, a lot of shows on... Pretty sure I've been on the phone literally all afternoon. I was going to do a workout at the country club, but that got pushed aside. I've got, inform- I got sort two private sources telling me that the Norfolk, Naval ba- Norfolk Virginia Naval Base is being evacuated. Uh, the ship's in dry dock. They're trying to get out of dry dock as fast as they can, and everything else is being moved to high ground. Uh, Camp Lejeune, uh, the naval, the Marine base at, in uh, North Carolina, is being evacuated to Fort Knox. Um, Fort Bragg is in the process of being evacuated, and Camp Pendleton, the Marine base not far from you, uh, on, in California, is being evacuated also. These are, these things are happening. By, right by evacuate, you mean they're evacuating the military out of there, or they're just yeah, being a war game? Heavy equipment and men and supplies. How far inland these. are they going? Uh, the um, People from Bragg are going to, some are going to Pennsylvania. They're probably going to different locations, the one outfit. They're being told that they're being moved to uh, Pennsylvania and getting ready to go to war in Syria, which makes no sense at all. You wouldn't move everything twice. Right. But that's, that's a cover story. Um, and uh, they have a due date of two weeks from today. They have everything, everything has to be done in the next two weeks. Hmm. Now, do you think so, it's a war game, or do you think it's based on... No, it's not going? a war game. This is, this is being based on these oceans coming out of their basins. That's what's going on. They're getting ready for the oceans to come out of their basins, and and uh, they're on a very fast track. Um, I'm continuing to get calls from my sources um, basically every few minutes as they, as they check with their people and get back with me. Yeah, that's pretty scary. Um well, it's about as scary as it gets. I'll be talking to my daughter tonight and getting her family ready to evacuate the West Coast. Now, how far inland do you think people will need to go in order to be away from the disaster? They need to be, the Navy says 400 feet above sea level. I say 800 to be safe. I'm seven miles in at 1,000 feet. Um, you should be fine. Yeah, I'll be fine. Be uh, fine. Uh, and I knew that actually I prayed on it. I thought, ooh, I don't want to be right on the coast because I knew about the danger of tsunamis. And then if you have a uh, tsunami that's uh, like Sendai, Japan, it's interesting that the, the, the kill zone is the Sendai uh, tsunami. If you were like yards from where the, the water stopped, it looked like nothing happened at all. If you could take pictures of the homes and the power lines and everything and say, oh, this looks like a beautiful place, trees and everything, you couldn't believe it. If it wasn't for the Fukushima Daiichi plant blowing up with the nuclear material right after the plant, after the disaster, they could have started rebuilding right away. Uh, but the area that the tsunami hits, and again, every three to five hundred years, and this is interesting, every three to five hundred years, a tsunami from the Azores strikes the east coast of the United States every three to five hundred years. We're not talking about three to five hundred thousand years. Same thing on the west coast. The natives have said this every three to five hundred years, there's a vague major tsunami strike from the Cascadia subduction zone that strikes the the uh, west coast of the United States 
<clears throat> that's pretty close, actually, the one off the Cascadia. I think it's around 1,200 miles long from Vancouver Island all the way south to uh, southern Oregon. Uh, that's a pretty big zone. So, right. yeah, I agree. I right. think that people need to be at least above 400 feet and, uh, inland about five to seven miles. Uh, and well, on the east coast of are, are private confidential sources, and they're, conf- uh, they're, they're confirming each other's information, uh, sometimes very cryptically. But they are giving us confirmation. Okay. Now, those are for the military sources. Now, right? Do you have any astro- astronomical ones, or do you have any animal? No, tea? no. That, that's we're cut off from that stuff coming out of the Antarctic. And uh, uh, your guy in Brazil is probably the best we've got. What's his name? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I, I posted it up a week or so ago. I think it's pronounced uh, uh, Ramos. I think it is. He uh, he's one of the senior astronomers at the Brazilian Observatory, and he's actually posted up information. He actually has spotted this object coming in. He's actually leaked information that I've had from other sources going back over four or five years now from the SPT South Pole Telescope, and they have the IRAS, the infrared telescope. They have the X-ray telescope aimed out in space, and, the, and what's called the stereo telescopes so that can look at the sun or any infrared object. There's tons of information that shows that this object's coming in. This is not like, right. We, I just don't know the exact dates. I do know that one of the things I was told at Space Command back in the mid-90s is that their favorite place to build underground cities was dormant magma domes when the crust of the Earth moves on a mantle. And I said, what? Yeah, the crust of the Earth moves on a mantle. And they've known this has happened over millions of years. And... Uh, the fact that the crust moves on the mantle is not surprising at all, is it? It really does happen. No, uh, the liquid moving underneath a solid. But uh, those, those domes, those old magma domes, would do a lot of the work for them. They'd be massive, uh, already underground yeah. sculpted yeah. areas. Yeah, and those are magma domes are anywhere from 4 to 12 cubic miles in size, so they're ideal for placing a city inside. The next would be matrix cities that they create by tunneling devices. They're not like the, what I call, very... Model T type ch- channel tunnel uh, tunneling devices. These are uh, sodium cooled nuclear reactor uh, hit right. the rock face at 10,000 degrees with impact lasers and blow the debris on the side to create an obsidian core and lay down track, a tri radiate track at the rate. Right now, back in the mid 90s uh, to the late 90s, it was actually around uh, seven miles per day. Now it's up to 14 to plus miles per day, and they're much bigger tunnels. So right. they've been building these cities, by the way. In America, just in the United States, average uh, six and a half to seven cubic miles in size, total total volume, uh, every seven weeks. So when people are wondering where is a lot of the money going to Bechtel Corporation, these other corporations, it's to build underground cities anywhere from a mile and a half to four miles underground. And they're all over there, crisscrossing all over the country, high-speed maglev trains everywhere. People say, oh, Dr. Deagle, this is where you get off on it. We don't want to believe you. I said, well, it's too bad. You know, the government spent hundreds of trillions of dollars on COG, continuity of government, continuity of what I call the elite. Well, it's absolutely true, and the confirmation I'm getting is very disturbing. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I've known for years that we would eventually get to this day, and perhaps we are here. Now, one of the things that's, uh, if you just want to intersect all these different timelines, the government has been buying bullets. If you actually look at the requisition of government purchase of bullets material, the movement back of 200,000 drones, the government's getting ready for something where the population is not going to like what the government's going to do, whether it's an no. avian swine flu pandemic. By the way, we now have the uh, alerts yesterday. I have uh, Tim Alexander had the reports. He talked to the Indiana Department of Health. We're now having reports from Hawaii and all over the place that the H3N2V, which contains the H1N1 swine vi- vi- virus genetics, is exploding all over America now. So we're having another pandemic. Another pandemic is starting right now. Not next year, not next month, today. Yeah, flu in the summertime. How about that? That's not, that's not normal. Uh, on top of the fact we get a weakened population, and Fukushima is starting to kind of cause wavering. So I'm seeing my radiation detector here in Southern California. Yeah, in 18 to 22, and now it's surging up to 60. And thinking, oh, oh, this has not been happening for about four months. Now it's starting to do it again. It's doing the background in February, March. Now it's doing it again. So... Something's happening in Fukushima, and they're getting no report to exactly how bad it is there. We come back more from John Moore and Morrison. Stay tuned.
Welcome back. And um, John, tell us more about uh, your colleague and uh, the kind of information you mentioned. Uh, Pendleton, by the way, Marine Corps base, virtually right. all of it is on the coast within probably like a mile. And it's actually, at, uh, I would say, maybe 300, 400 feet above sea level. My, my colleague at Republic Broadcasting, Mike Harris, and I are working careful, closely on this. He has multiple sources in the military and in the, in the intelligence community, both. And I got I got I got word about three hours ago from a source that Norfolk, Virginia Naval Base, was being uh, evacuated, and then Mike called me about an hour ago and told me that he got independent confirmation from a Navy SEAL at Norfolk Naval Base that they were in fact evacuating. Mm -hmm. Now. Um Okay, here's a, let's say that this is all true and it's going to happen, let's say in the month, next month or two months. The consequences are a massive inundation of the east and west coast, probably much more severe on the, on the east coast than the west coast, because the west coast geology is completely different, where it rises within about a mile or so from the uh, west coast to about five to 600 feet above sea level. Where it's not like a lot of critical infrastructure on the west coast. It's quite oh, yeah, in fact, near sea level. Yeah, here's the other thing most people don't realize. A lot of the, the uh, uh, military bases, especially things like Vandenberg Air Force Base, the real space program, not the Tinker Toy system they launched off of Cape Canaveral, used to be called Cape Kennedy. Um, and a lot of the other military bases are right on the coast, including the uh, Fifth Fleet in right. San Diego. That's right. And they're sitting right on the coast. So most of the infrastructure, uh, three-quarters of the parts manufacturers for our jet aircraft, for our fighter forces, forces are made in California. Uh, most of our, uh, if you want to call it software backup for our long-range targeting weapon systems, including Lucent Technologies here. Some of it's in Colorado, but most of it's here in California. California basically is the seat of the real space program. Uh, most of the advanced space-based weapon systems, most of the advanced mind control research, most of the advanced uh, work on almost anything, including in genetic engineering, even the super soldier program is all based here in California. Right. It's all sitting within, by the way, Seattle, a mile or two of the coast. Where Boeing manufactures a lot of their aircraft in Seattle is basically 50 or 60 feet above sea level. Yeah. Now, so that now let's say that we'll pause it just for a moment that this could happen. Uh, what are the consequences militarily? Can you make a projection of what will happen to America in terms of its international well, policies and activities, etc.? Uh, the Chinese are convinced that this is their century, and. Uh, um, it would be, you know, implementing the principles of Sun Tzu. It would be the, the uh, chance, only a one chance in a lifetime to take advantage of us being reduced to uh, not having spare parts and being crippled militarily. Yeah, but of course they would be making a, a very fatal error because, believe it or not, just if our space-based weapon systems are operational, which they will be, uh, if there are a couple of uh, operational commands, an entire nation like China would disappear. So well, I, 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 don't, I don't know what the Chinese have or what they in, intend to do, but uh, they, they, they have no idea have, what they're facing. Is what I'm trying to say. Having known it firsthand, the Chinese and the Russians are one of the things that's restraining them, even when we transfer technology to them, is that. And I remember this from a discussion of uh, a lucid technology. And we've been sold out at the top by a Marxist. Uh, Oh, they're selling us out. We have, we're, 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 we're being sold out of the top where they transferred supercomputers to the Chinese during the last 20 years after, uh, you know, Richard Nixon went there. We've been selling out uh, a lot of technology, but there's still lots of things that have been held back. Uh, uh, I agree. But we, if we have a Marxist in the White House who's in, in cahoots with these people, uh, we may be sold down the river. Yeah, I don't think he'll complete the process unless he gets another term. If we have another four years of Obama, we're done. Well, uh, but again, a lot of other these events are, are happening right now. So let's pause it. It happens, okay? Uh, we're not just going to have an inundation here in the day, Canada. It won't just hit here, by the way. The Chinese are okay, building right. coastal super cities, literally 100, 200 miles inland. Yeah, you heard about that, right? That's they right. Built, they built hundreds of these giant cities. It's like, and there's nobody there. It's like. Uh, if you actually go, you can act, I've seen the photo actually. People send me a whole bunch of you know hundreds of photos and say, "Whoa, look at these cities!" And you look to see if there's people. There's nobody there. This is the weirdest thing. It's like these are ghost cities. They actually have. Right. I think National Geographic's done a special on it. The ghost cities of China, and they're right. built literally like hundreds of miles from the coast in the middle of nowhere. It's like right. What right. are they? Desert. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like what are they doing? And they also, by the way, and this, this is tied in with, with Maury Strong, by the way, is tied in with the investment. They have 100,000 warehouses they built in the last five years alone, storing every kind of material from 
wood from Africa to coal to special uh, minerals, metals, everything stored in giant warehouses, and it's not even lined up to be sent off to be manufacturing plants to be turned into, you know, iPads or anything. It's just being stored. It's just, it's just being, they're, just, they're restoring up strategic uh, material that they're for the future. Right, so in other words, logistically, they're storing up, and this is uh, a conservative number, 100,000 warehouses, and we're talking about a million square feet plus each one of them. These are giant warehouses. Well, there's only three things that matter in war, logistics, logistics, logistics. <laughs> yeah, I know you're the expert on that. So, yeah. um, no, two weeks is basically the date when they think this is going to start to transpire. What yeah, do you think will be yeah. the first warning sign of, of it in terms of the Earth? Because what we're going to have is not a near passage of an object that's going to come within a very short distance. We're talking about something that will probably be somewhere around 55 million miles. There's two types of consequences that will happen. The first is gravity waves and the effect on what's called the uh, plasma activity inside the sun and inside the Earth. Most people don't realize the Earth is a nuclear reactor with a crust on it and a geomagnetic envelope or power force field around it that prevents it would develop some called a Van Allen radiation belt and the sun is again a giant nuclear fusion reactor so the earth is a nuclear reactor most people only realize that right. we're living on the crust of a nuclear reactor right. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing you know we actually think you're spinning in space living on the crust in a little blue line of thin air in, an, in a radiation re reduced environment that is very fragile and when they got a few well, rocks, or like we're looking at the, this energy could cut loose the, the rocks at, at the Canary Islands, and the second thing would be that this energy could cause a pole shift. Right now, the pole shift is a, doesn't need an entire pole reversal. No, it could uh, be, all it would take would be 15 degrees. That would be enough to bring these oceans out of their basins. I think one of the things that the research that I saw, I think, it was 80 million years ago. 80 million years ago, Alaska was on the equator. Well, you, you can dig down through the the uh, permafrost and find tropical plants right now. Right. Now, also, we know that the, the climate was quite different as little as twelve to 15,000 years ago. That I remember my friends went up to Baffin Island from the Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and uh, the Bedford Institute in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I did research with Bedford Institute. And I had friends that actually were in my class that went up to Baffin Island, and they were actually uh, exhumed tusks of woolly mammoths that were 26 feet long, three times larger in mass than the average sized African elephant. Oh, yeah. They had, they had giant trees that were like the, that we were looming like the Douglas first, 200 feet above ground in Baffin Island. Now, Baffin Island, you got to get an idea how big it is. Baffin Island is like half the size of Australia. Well, it's that's a big. big place. It's a big place. And so when you get up to these areas, you think, oh, no, it's just an island, just a little island. No, 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 no. Baffin Island's big. Just go look at the map of the Dang, you know, I think he goes right. This is a big island. So that climate Bill, changed very rapidly. I need to scoot here. You guys have a great show. If there's any uh, major breakthroughs, uh, I'm going to give you a call. We're going to be talking next. So in other words, the uh, the scary uh, alarm is not turned off. Oh boy, sounds good. We'll hear more from Ann in a moment. Um, and of course, bottom of the hour, we hope to get Christina Consolo, Roberts off for a little while doing some research. Get back in a moment. So, Ann, you mentioned um, in that first uh, segment uh, that the object 2012 DA14, we want a correction there. I think it's 195, uh, is it feet across? It's a 197 foot asteroid. Right, now that asteroid probably has some debris around, maybe the size of a VW bus or uh, a refrigerator as well. And that object is going to come pretty close. I think it's a 1% chance. When I looked at the JPL site last week, it's a 1% chance of it impacting on Earth, which means it could take out something in an area the size of Luxembourg. You know, it's pretty big. It can take an area of, let's say, three to 400 square miles. Easy. Well, the thing I'm interested in was that in uh, February, I mean, in this last March, they said it was going to pass at a distance of of 16,000, 17,000 miles, and now they're saying it's going to pass within 5,000 miles. The Earth's gravitational field is going to alter the asteroid's path significantly because the Earth is so much bigger than the asteroid. Yeah, yeah. So it just yeah. may pull it in. I mean, 5,000 miles is not that far away. Right, right. Um, it would be as hard if the whole asteroid were to... Actually, the one that hit... Tunguska w broke apart in the atmosphere, and it damaged, I mean, it obliterated 
an area the size of the country of Luxembourg. Right. Well, actually, I think it was uh, I think the one in, in uh, Tunguska covered an area of somewhere around uh, 830 square miles. Yeah, it was a huge area. It was a huge area, 830 square miles. By the way, there was a microblast that hit Colorado in the mountains. We talked about this in the show about four or five years ago. That microburst, uh, which is the higher speed, uh, you know, air it can come down from the upper troposphere, you know, 30,000, 40,000 miles, 50,000, I mean, 50,000 feet up. And when it descended to Earth, by the way, it was hitting a speed of 800 to 1,000 miles an hour, and it flattened 800 square miles of forest in the uh, in remote area of Colorado back of, oh, over a decade and a half ago. Um, these kind of well, extreme weather things can happen. On the uh, JPL NEO website, the condition code is four, and that means that the uncertainty in the orbit is 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 large. So they don't know whether it's going to be five thousand miles plus three thousand miles or five thousand miles minus three thousand miles. For instance. No. Uh, we keep on telling people, and I'm going to be doing a major update to our preparedness, and and then the last thing we're going to have a little update from Christina Consola, who will be on on Monday, talking about the radiation and all the anomalies occurring from it. If you look at the converging issues, we've got crop failure everywhere, mm -hmm. economic uh, implosion occurring in Europe. We have the West pushing like crazy with the Congress and Senate pushing a bill to actually cause an act of war, which is a basically an embargo against even financial institutions in China. The China... Uh, it's called the China Bank of Iraq. And they've been doing financial transactions to allow the Iranians to sell their oil, although we passed the uh, Kirk Amendment that allows Russia to not to, and China to avoid the embargo against Iranian oil. We're basically squeezing the Iranians, which basically they're saying they're buying staples for their food, for their population. And uh, most of the countries like India and other countries, Japan, have cut their purchases of Iranian oil. The biggest problem is they're saying they have to have Iranian tankers bring oil in to their service depots in India, and uh, they're not able to have enough tankers to do it. So a lot of them, they've loaded up all the tankers they can, and they're often circulating out in the ocean before they can even distribute. Uh, if they do completely close down the ability to financially for Iran to sell their oil, they guarantee that the Iranians have already passed a bill a month ago will close the Strait of Hormuz. Now, this is all happening at the same time when you have these nearest objects coming by in the next six months, when we have literally in the next two to, to six weeks, according to John's sources, and uh, that we have uh, a major event going to happen to the planet. Now, uh, you know, I don't have a confirmation of that in terms of dating, but I do know that the, uh, we are likely to have major earth changes increasing. The most serious of them, by the way, is what you've talked about, and we've talked about is called a coronal mass ejection, not a pole shift. Uh, CME is increasing. We know next year is the peak of cycle 24. If um, I think it's, what's the name of that cycle? AR 17 something. Uh, which you can 1540. go to 1540. We can go to the uh, spaceweather.com website. You can see this site is like a madman with a shotgun spinning on a platform, blindfolded, shooting out into space. And if any of these shots are, you know, Earth centric, they hit the Earth with an X or M class, we could have major degradation. And, and there's some very strong suspicion that besides the peak loading by farmers trying to pump water in India, that these CMEs were the underlying reason why the grid failed in India. What's your theory on that? Do you think that there was some interaction there between extra load from the pumping and maybe coronal mass ejection causing a surge on the power grid so the, so the grid failed? Uh, it came pretty late for that. I'm suspecting... Uh, but you can have degradation even a week or two. Terrorism. Yeah, but you can have degradation even a week or two before. People think that it has to happen like within a certain number of hours or days. What well, I found out from the power right. experts, you can actually burn out power substations, and they can kind of just degrade them so they're going to fail, let's say, two weeks or a month or so later. It doesn't happen to happen right away. And then you put an extra load because now all of a sudden everybody's pumping water because they, they have a horrible drought, and the power grid can't withstand that load because the step-down transformers and other things have already been degraded by the surge of power on the lines. Yeah, and they do have a lot of uh, people that steal the electricity. They just make unauthorized attachments to the power lines. Oh, really? So yeah. They... yeah. I heard that there are various states, too, they are stealing more power than they're supposed to because the government runs the power grid, 
but most of the manufacturers of power are private. So it's a really stupid system the way they have it set up in India. They don't have public power generation, and they don't have you know ways of controlling the power grid that maintain some kind of you know without the wild west and power where you know people are grabbing more power than they should or are able to grab, and then the grid goes down. By the way, the uh, speaking of that, you know the the oil pipelines that cross from Egypt over into uh, Israel, they uh, cross the Sinai, and people will go and they'll punch a hole deliberately in the in the uh, pipeline, and then they'll fill up their buckets with the oil and <laughs> steal the oil that way. And occasionally it'll happen that uh, uh, there'll be a uh, light of some kind and it'll explode, and then they'll have a pipeline explosion. Now the uh, Israelis have called back anybody uh, anybody who is in Sinai right now. Because of the change in government in Egypt, the Sinai is no longer uh, safe for Israelis. And, in fact, they think the major attack will come from the Sinai, from uh, Egypt. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly. In other words, what we see happening is now the Muslim Brotherhood's there, um, that the alignments between the military and the current uh, Mr. Morsi are likely to increase the danger to Israel. And Israel, of course, is not... The type of country you tick off. Uh, if no. Israel thinks you're about to attack, they're going to attack you. Yeah. And that means Hezbollah in Lebanon, it means Syria, where they're literally just averted an attack. Uh, they were literally backed off by the IDF itself because they said, no, no, we don't need to do that. Just like I personally don't think you need to actually do this military maneuver, economic maneuver to attack Iran by full sanctions yet. I think it should be held back. Uh, what they need to do is, is say we're going to have a United Nations demand that you have full inspection of all the sites and you have people in place permanently to make sure that they can't create weapons grade uranium and the russians and chinese actually would be stupid not to agree to that because if they don't what the west will do is they will allow the israelis to go crazy and the israelis have shown it before at the osirak reactor in syria many years ago back in the early 80s where they attacked i remember it. that yeah and where they also attacked uh, just uh was a year or two ago, again, back in Syria, they had the North Koreans were building a nuclear plant as well in Syria. So this, the Syrians want nuclear weapons. And it wouldn't at all surprise me that they already have short-range missiles and they have nuclear material from Pakistan because Pakistan has the third biggest well, nuclear right. weapons stockpile generation uh, system on Earth right now, as Pakistan does. And everybody's not talking about Iran and Syria. The real guys to really watch are Pakistan. And Pakistan's no little country. It has enough nuclear forces to take out India of 1.3 uh, billion people. Okay, closer to home, um, Edison, which runs the uh, reactors at San Onofre, yes. you know, there's reactor number two and reactor number three have been shut down right. because of the uh, two problems. Well, they've, they're suggesting, this came out on Nuclear Street News on uh, Wednesday, that uh, reactor two, they set a date, a restart date of November 18th for units for reactor two. Welcome back, and we're joined with Christina Consola. I want you to com complete that thought and about the uh, steam turbines up in San Onofre, no more than about 12 miles away from where I'm actually sitting here in my studio. Very happy when they shut the plant down because I know when they had the station blackout, we had a surge in uh, radioisotopes because it went up to four times background for about three or four days. So I know we were having problems in Fukushima, but it didn't just fluctuate. It stayed up there for about three to four days after we had that power blackout September 8th last year. Uh, this is not a rational thing they're doing, and this new director of the NRC is not coming up with a public statement saying, I object. To me, there's a basic flaw in the design. It's not, quote, like or equal engineering-wise when the original design said 9,750 tubes per turbine. And now they're putting a lot more tubes. They say they're just going to plug them up, the ones that are not behaving or they're leaking. This is craziness. There's a basic flaw in the design. And they know it's going to release tritium. They know it's going to release radioisotopes. And they know it's not safe. It's also, by the way, sitting across from a subduction fault zone, which they found, I think, around 13 years ago, the um, San Jacinta Falls upthrust, which is virtually identical to the upthrust zone that caused the Sendai, Japan uh, tsunami. And that's only about four and a half miles off the coast of Pendleton, Marine Corps Base, and uh, San Onofre. Well, we, we know that the uh, coast along California is in uh, subsidence, so it's, it's going to um, fall. Southern California, I mean, coastal along California is going to fall. 
the coast along the northwest is going to raise because it has the Juan de Fuca plate, and the Juan de Fuca plate is going to push it up. So you have to take that into consideration, too. Well, uh, but, yeah. But yeah, well, what's what going on is the subduction is underneath the Pacific plate, which is in California, so it's, it's diving underneath the, the uh, North American plate. And... Uh, not in, not at southern, not in California, not along the California one. Yeah, well, that area there, we have the San Jacinto uh, Ostras zone there, just off the but coast. But in any case, what they want to do is they have about 10,000, they have about 20,000 tubes per reactor. They have two reactors, reactor two and reactor three. Both of them have bad tubes. What they're going to do is they're going to take some of the tubes out of service. And these tubes carry the radioactive water that, that is hot that they use to run the steam generators. And um, they're not doing a full design review on this. They say, well, we'll just reduce the power, and so we won't have so much stress on the tubes, even though we have fewer tubes, and also we won't have as much uh, shaking or vibration. Right. And, this does not make sense to me. I mean, they should have a full design review before they make this decision. I think so, too. And it, to me, it's uh, without being a nuclear engineer, having worked as a doctor on nuclear plants and knowing enough, especially since last year, talking to Chris and other experts, this is craziness. And it basically says, oh, we don't care about the health of 26 million Americans living within, you know, say, 30, 40 miles of the, uh, the plant. We don't care. We don't care if we make the whole place radioactive. And, you know, Jay Leno had some things with all his fancy cars. Ah, it's no big deal. Sorry, Jay, if the prevailing wind carries it there and that plant uh, loses control, like uh, the plants in Japan, there's a lot of radiation stored over 40 years there. This is going to get really bad. Well, and I'm, I'm afraid it's what's going to be really bad for the people there. If, uh, if I mean, these are these tubes are so critical to the operation of the plant. Well, I guess if, if what John says is going to happen, it'll make it all kind of moot points. I mean, if you have a... A major tsunamis or or swamping. I mean, do you, you realize how close the San Onofre reactor is sitting on the coast? It's literally almost on the beach. Oh, I know. I used to go swimming there. Yeah, well, it's uh, like not it's there, really, but close there. But close by, you can go to Dana Point and these other areas. You go like, oh, there's a beach area right there. You know, hey, let's let's go on the beach and look at the uh, <laughs> at, at the uh, funny looking. Uh, Almost obscene looking, almost obscene looking to, uh, uh, you know, cone shaped, uh, I'm not going to use the other term for it, uh, bra shaped uh, kind of uh, reactor sites of uh, San Onofre. It looks kind of obscene when they're whipping along the freeway. So, uh, well, maybe, maybe that's why they're evacuating Pendleton. Who knows? You know, it's, again, a lot of time we don't have all the answers, but we, we raise really good questions. Uh, and uh, if you're getting multiple sources, as I said before, the first thing you think of is, number one, it's a very elaborate government ruse to release information that's through multiple sources. Without, I don't have astronomical corroboration that is this close, uh, which is very concerning because it means they want to manipulate the population and do a war game in preparation for something else. Or number two, it really is true, but they've managed to, to kind of curtail other sources of information so much you can't get corroboration. Because I don't have any astronomical corroboration that the... Uh, Nemesis dwarf star, the Passover star is that close that we're going to have a, a gravity wave that's going to cause that in the next month. I just, okay, I think I, Christine has something to say about the uh, yeah. Diablo yeah. plant. So tell us about Diablo. Tell us, Christine, about what's going on there. At Diablo? Diablo um, and at, at San Onofre and these other plants, because you also mentioned all the radiation. We're going to talk about it on Monday in that first hour on what's yeah. going on around the world. Yeah, we we've uh, we started um, Facebook pages for independent plants, just so people in the area that want to get more involved with their community and um, you know going to city council meetings and so forth. If you're going to speak out about the no freeze situation, you need to do it now because once they get that plant restarted, it's going to be very hard to shut down. In fact, it won't be shut down until it has another problem. Four thousand tons spent fuel on that site. All the pools are full. No now, you didn't, you didn't say four times. You said four, and the word was thousand times? Four thousand. Ooh. That's a big ooh, isn't it? Yeah, and that's not talked about in, in any of these reports either about the two. You know, now, by the way, is this liquid uh, radioactive waste or solid waste? What form is it? This is solid waste. These are fuel rods. They're not mm. in dry casts. They're in, they're in fuel pools. Fuel pools. Fuel pools. Sounds like almost like fool pools. Would that be a better term for them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Possibly. Uh, can you tell me how to access that uh, Facebook page? Yes, um, you can find it by searching for uh, San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station in Diablo Canyon. And we just keep adding them at whenever a reactor problem comes up. I think we're up to 12 or 13 in addition to the Fukushima page so, that we have. So you just go San Onofre Nuclear Regeneration page? Is that how you search, uh, yeah, search for them? Yeah, for people who, who don't want all the nuclear news, they just want what's going on in their area. People can post sickness yeah. reports, radiation readings, city council meetings, um, upcoming NRC meetings. You know, because the time to act, that that window is closing. Yeah. So this is kind yeah. of like a meetup plant on Facebook by the end of the year. Yeah. Um, the yeah. pages are on Facebook. Yes. I mean, is this kind of like a meetup thing where people can talk about it? Is there in yeah. the neighborhood? Yeah, and and then we post any um, you know news articles that come up in the feeds about these specific plants too. Now, how how bad do you think it could get? For example, if what John is saying. And these other sources saying actually starts to happen. But we have major tsunamis and sea rising on either coasts. And virtually all our reactors are sitting on bodies of water exposed to this, especially on the East Coast. Here in the West Coast, the Ambo Canyon is on, the, on literally converging three fault lines on a native burial ground, which is really bad. And San Onofre is sitting across the San Jacinta subduction fault zone, uh, literally on the beach. It was 4,000 tons of radioactive stoves. This, this is not good. It was even built there in the first place. Did yeah, I know. Well, well, they knew about this beforehand. They released it three, 13 years ago. They probably knew well before that. Um, why do you think they did that? What's your kind of, you know, what I call reverse logic of why would the military and the government, San Onofre is a pretty important uh, reactor to be sitting right on Camp Fenelon, which is the uh, largest Marine Corps base in the, in, in the world. And why would they do that? Um, possibly to um, for shipping any of the plutonium that's generated from the reactors to make weapons to the various labs in the area uh, or in, on that side of the country. I mean, I don't know that they're still collecting plutonium, but each reactor generates about 500 pounds of plutonium a year, which we, you know, use in our artillery uh, when yeah. when we go and. Democracy. Now, one of the things people don't understand about, uh, and this is one of my other sources, I have actual first on hand contact sources that have been inside the underground city under Pendleton Marine Corps Base. What's underground is hundreds of times bigger than what's above ground. And it's not just on the coast, it's all over Pendleton. Pendleton covers hundreds of square miles. It's a giant underground city uh, underneath Pendleton Marine Corps Base. So, uh, Weird things are happening. Again, I don't have all the answers. All I can say is, uh, God help us. Uh, check it out. Be prepared. Uh, we're going to discuss this more on nuclear issues on uh, Monday. And closing comments about what's going on. Well, I think we need to, uh, I mean, what this news that John has given us is just devastating. And I stay close to home because uh, you don't know who's going to be traveling on your highways. It may be the military. Yeah, and, and uh, Highway 5, by the way, is really close to the, uh, and, and the tents, you know, basically the coastal highway here in California is right on the coast. Uh, highway 15 is pretty far inland, so we would be okay, but uh, that would be basically one artery getting out of Southern California toward Riverside County in Los Angeles, or uh, Northern Orange County. Right. Scary stuff. Back again next week, God willing. <laughs>